Okay guys, so welcome back. Now we're going to take a look at what happens after the RNA has been built by RNA polymerase during transcription. And we call that post-transcriptional modifications because they happen after transcription and basically the RNA is going to be modified. So the post-transcriptional modification happens right here in this stage in eukaryotic cells. The RNA in transcript will need to be modified before leaving the nucleus. And so this is where we are located. Still in the nucleus, before the RNA can leave the nucleus, it has to go through some modifications. Now, I specifically said in eukaryotic cells because prokaryotic cells actually skip this stage. They do not have to go through post-transcriptional modifications. Remember, prokaryotic cells are bacteria cells, and bacteria cells do not have a nucleus. So obviously, there is no leaving the nucleus. The, everything happens within the cytoplasm. Both transcription and translation happen within the cytoplasm. And because they both happen within the cytoplasms, prokaryotic cells actually can undergo both processes, transcription and translation, simultaneously. This is called coupled transcription translation, and it is a big time saver for prokaryotic cells. As the RNA is being built through transcription, the RNA is being read by ribosomes and translation is occurring simultaneously at the same time. Another thing that can happen in, in prokaryotic cells is that many ribosomes can actually translate the mRNAs as they're being built. So you can have many transcriptions happening simultaneously. So you can have many RNA polymerases reading the DNA, building mRNAs, and then many ribosomes attaching to the mRNAs and producing proteins at the same time. So it's a very efficient system that includes the formation of what are called polysomes or polyribosomes where you have just a lot of transcription happening simultaneously and a lot of translation also happening at the same time. So what happens to eukaryotic RNA though? What kind of modifications need to happen? So there are three modifications and they have really fun words to sort of describe them or summarize them. They're called capping, tailing, and splicing. So those are the three things that have to happen to RNA. Before RNA is finished and becomes actual mRNA, so the primary RNA transcript or just the RNA transcript has to go through capping, then it'll go through tailing, and then it'll go through splicing. So let's go through each of these. Capping is essentially the adding of something at the five prime end. What is going to be added is something called a five prime cap. A five prime cap is basically a tiny little bit of RNA that has, um, it's called 7-methylguanosine cap, which is basically has a lot of guanines and, and just a, a slightly different molecule attached to it. And that goes on the top of the molecule, so in the 5' prime end of the molecule. And the reason for that is for protecting the mRNA. When the mRNA is going to leave the nucleus into the cytoplasm, it's going to leave the safety of that nucleus into a more hostile environment of the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm is full of enzymes that are there to basically pull apart mRNA and, and destroy it. And so the cap is going to help keep the RNA protected. So think about it this way. If you're gonna go outside of the safety of your home, you might put a cap on your head, and that cap is going to protect you from the sun. So it's protection. You put a cap before you leave, right? And also assist in ribosome attachment. So the ribosomes are going to need to find the mRNA and then attach to it in order for the ribosomes to start reading the mRNA and building the protein. And so the M the five prime cap helps with that attachment. Tailing happens at the other end, at the three prime end. And so a tail is added to that end. It's called a poly A tail because it has many or poly uh, adenines or A's. So between 50 to 200 adenines are added to the back end of the or the three prime end of the of the molecule and that is there a hundred percent for protection and that's it so the cap the five prime cap is for both protection and for helping the mRNA attach itself to the ribosomes the tail is just there for protection how does it protect the mRNA 
when enzymes are trying to destroy the mRNA, they're going to start just eating at it. And so if you have this really long tail that has between 50 to 200 at basis, then the genes themselves, the code that is found in the RNA molecule is going to be protected because the enzymes are going to start eating away at the RNA at that tail. And so a lot of those A's, adenines, are going to be destroyed before they actually get into the actual code of the RNA molecule. Let's talk about splicing. So splicing is all about cutting up the RNA and then putting it back together. So here's the thing about genes in eukaryotic cells that is really strange. This does not happen at all in prokaryotic DNA. Only in eukaryotic DNA is that we have both coding regions and non-coding regions within our DNA. So let's take a step back and take a look at what that means. Coding regions are regions of DNA that code for protein, that code for the amino acids that make up our protein, that contain the words that give us the recipe that we need to make our cookies, say for example. But within those recipes, there's also a lot of nonsense words. So non-coding regions is actually very common in DNA. As a matter of fact, most of our DNA strand is made up of non-coding regions. I've given you the analogy of DNA like a recipe book, but it would be a very strange recipe book because if you pick up a recipe book, you would expect that, you know, maybe there's a thousand recipes in the recipe book. Maybe there's a couple of pages at the beginning that is just the introduction and the index, and maybe a couple of pages at the end that just give some acknowledgments and stuff and some information about the author. But in between, you would expect it to be basically shock full of recipes, and that's it. Every page, just recipes. But our DNA strand is not quite exactly like that. It would be like you had a recipe book and it has a thousand recipes, but in between each series of pages that contain recipes, there might be maybe a hundred or two hundred pages of just nonsense words or ads. There's no recipes in those pages, just a whole bunch of other stuff. Maybe it's nonsense stuff, maybe it's some other stuff that gives you other type of information, but definitely not the information to make your cookies. And so that's the non-coding regions of DNA, and you find them in between the genes. So the genes are not stockpile one right next to the other. There's vast amounts of DNA in between genes that are just nonsense. But the neat thing is that even within the genes, there is these non-coding regions. So it would be, again, you find the recipe and you've copied it out, but you find that after you've copied out the recipe because you basically started reading what it said, starting at the beginning, how to make chocolate chip cookies, and you started writing, you find out that you wrote a whole bunch of information in between the recipe that is not actually the recipe. Maybe you wrote out some ads that were in between, that are found within the recipe book itself, or some nonsense letters and words that just make no sense. And so what splicing is, is about removing those parts that are not the coding regions out of the mRNA transcript so that when the mRNA is read and a protein is made, only the amino acids that make up the protein go in. And so these regions are called exons and introns. Exons are the ones that are the coding regions that actually get to exit the nucleus. Introns are the non-coding regions that end up staying inside the nucleus. So this is where the words come from. So exons get to leave the nucleus, so they're the ones that contain the code. Introns stay inside. And so introns are removed by molecules called spliceosomes. So spliceosomes are special enzymes that essentially cut out the introns and re-anneal, reattach the exons to each other, so forming a, a molecule that only has the exons. And so you can see here you have two introns in red and three exons in this RNA transcript. And then the spliceosome, what it does is it essentially just loops the introns so that they can just be cut out and then in the process anneals or bonds the exons to each other. So what's the point of these coding and non-coding regions? Well, one interesting thing that was found when scientists were studying the coding and non-coding regions of eukaryotic DNA and eukaryotic RNA was that exons 
can actually be joined in different ways and in different combinations depending on what type of protein is required. So one interesting thing that was found is that we don't have one gene for every protein. We have one gene for many proteins sometimes. And it all depends on which parts are cut out and which parts are left. So this is a process called alternative splicing. And it works like this. So let's imagine you have this piece of DNA and take a look at that. There are different alternative ways in which the introns and exons can be removed. So depends on what's removed, you might end up with one alternative or a second alternative, or maybe three or four. So imagine you have a recipe for chocolate chip cookies, and if you remove certain introns out of it, you end up with chocolate chip cookies that end up with dark chocolate chips. But if you do another combination of, of removals of certain parts, you may end up with one that has white chocolate chips, or a third combination could end up giving you maybe one that has walnuts. And so different ways of ordering the code can give you different variations of proteins. And so this is one of the mechanisms by which eukaryotic cells can get away with small amounts of coding regions in DNA that actually code for a lot more proteins than the number of coding regions that we have. Now that we have capped, tailed, and spliced our RNA, now it's called an mRNA, and it can actually leave the nucleus from translation. And so now we get into this part, translation, how we go from RNA to proteins. And so the mRNA is decoded in this part in order to produce a very specific amino acid sequence in order to create a polypeptide that will then later fold into an active protein. And we start with ribosomes because this is where the translation is going to happen. Ribosomes are basically tiny little organelles that are made up of both protein and our RNA or ribosomal RNA and small subunit that are actually found separate from each other and joined together only during translation. And we're also going to need some tRNA. tRNA is basically the molecule that is going to transfer the correct amino acids to the building polypeptide. It has one section at, at the three prime end that accepts only a very specific amino acid. So it can bind to a very specific amino acid that it finds within the cytoplasm. And at another end of it, it has a three letter, what is called an anticodon, a three letter code that is going to be complementary to the codon that codes for that amino acid that it carries on the other end. So let's begin with the stages of translation. And just like transcription had three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination, so does translation. So during initiation, three things are going to happen. First of all, the small ribosomal subunit is going to attach to the bottom of the mRNA strand. It is actually going to attach using the five prime cap as an aid. Remember the five prime cap was there to help with the attachment to the ribosome. The second thing that's going to happen is that the first tRNA is going to bring the first amino acid to the mRNA, and that's the start codon. So the ribosomal subunit is going to scan the mRNA until it reaches the start codon, which is AUG, which is always the start codon for all proteins. And then once it reaches there, that's where it's going to stay. That's where the small ribosomal subunit is going to stay for now. And the tRNA carrying methionine is going to attach to that start codon. How will it attach? We'll notice that it has a complementary anticodon. It has three bases, UAC, which are complementary to AUG and can therefore hydrogen bond to those. And so it's going to attach with that anticodon at one end, carry some methionine amino acid on the other end. Once that happens, the large ribosomal subunit can now attach, and the second stage called elongation can begin. During elongation, each codon is going to be read one at a time. And so the large ribosomal subunit can actually hold two tRNA molecules at once. Um, there are a couple of sites that are called the P side and the A side. P side is because that's where a peptide bond is going to form, and the A side because that's where a new amino acid is going to be coming in. And so essentially, 
the ribosome moves along the mRNA a codon at a time, so three bases at a time, and reads the next codon that comes up. So we started with the methionine, and then it's going to read the next codon, and it's going to bring the appropriate amino acid to that. Obviously, this GIF is short, and it only doesn't show the whole process. It's just showing the first three codons right there. So what happens is every single time that the, the ribosome moves along, a new amino acid can enter the A side, being carried by tRNA that has an anticodon that is complementary to the codon that codes for the particular amino acid it carries. And so the enzyme then that is responsible for making the peptide bond between the amino acids that are brought in in order to actually build a protein is called peptidyl transferase, and that's the one that forms the peptide bonds on the pizza. The ribosome just continues to move along the mRNA, and depending on the size of the protein, it might read a few hundred codons, it might read a few thousand codons. Most proteins have between several hundred to maybe several thousand amino acids. And it eventually is going to get to a codon that is going to call for the stopping of the whole process. And that's one of the three stop codons. And so the ribosome is eventually going to reach one of these three stop codons. And that's actually not going to code for a tRNA to come in. It's going to code for a specific molecule called the release factor that actually is complementary to that stop codon. And it's going to bind at the A side. And that's basically going to trigger the complete disassembly of that whole entire ribosome. And so the ribosome is going to separate from the mRNA. And as a matter of fact, can go on and attach to another mRNA and start the process again. And the mRNA itself is not done. It can continue to be used to build more protein by having more ribosomes attaching to it. So this is the end of today's lesson. And uh, we've covered quite a few things during this two-part lesson on protein synthesis transcription, post-transcriptional modifications, as well as translation. Have a good evening, guys. Talk to you soon.